Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf today. I'm going to continue my question and answer series with the fourth installment. This is probably going to be serialized because I got over a hundred questions. Thank you all so much. So if my outfit changes or my hair changes or the lighting changes, don't be alarmed. I'm not a shapeshifter or anything like that. It's just that I'm going to have to break these into install installments across a number of days to get to them all. If any of the questions were repeats of questions from the first three videos, I think I was able to respond to those of you and let you know and point you to those. And But uh, some of them I will repeat because my answer, answers have changed slightly. So let's relax. Let's settle in. Uh, green tea. And here we go. From Departure J on Twitter, who are your top five literary critics? Harold Bloom, William Gass, Michael Durda, Stephen Moore, and Virginia Woolf or Maureen Corrigan. From Daniel Backer on Instagram, what was your first favorite book as a kid? Don't even have to think about it. Calvin and Hobbes. From Instagram's Steakhouse slash Paul. Will you do a theology book tour? Yes, I will. I uh, will get to that eventually. Uh, I apologize that it's been so long since my last bookshelf tour video, which I think was on poetry. But yes, from Sophie on Instagram, do you like movies? Which ones? Yes. Uh, though I don't watch movies nearly as much as I read for contemporary cinema, I really love uh, the movies from Christopher Nolan. I mean, The Prestige. Inception, Interstellar. I just recently watched Tenet. Uh, this guy makes incredible movies. From more like classic cinema, uh, I like Inumar Berryman, the uh, gloomy Swede. I like uh, Antonioni, Fellini. I like Truffaut. I like Rome. I like some of the films from uh, Lars von Trier. I liked Catherine Bigelow's Hurt Locker. Uh, Zero Dark, Dark Thirty, not so much. And I'm sure there are others. Those are just the ones that come to mind. Have you read The Pale King? John No Relation Wayne asks on Instagram. Yes uh, and no. And I hate it when people answer a question with yes and no, but this is kind of truthful. Uh, yes, I've read uh, not all of it, but a good portion of it before uh, putting it on hold. Um, I have read a lot of uh, criticism about it that makes me want to go and read it in its entirety, but there's just something something about it, it, its publication that, and the way it was put together posthumously, that, I don't know, there's a part of me that feels like I'm not really reading David Foster Wallace. It's kind of the same thing that kind of makes me put, uh, what is it, Roberto Bolaño's found stories, cowboy matches, is that right? Sounds kind of right. Something about cowboys, but kind of makes me put that at arm's length too, just because I know these were found and kind of put together from notes and things like that. There's just something about that that sort of puts me off personally. Um, so yes and no. Ravindu Sheehan asks, at what age did you start reading literary fiction? Uh, that would be about ninth grade. So about 14, 13, 14. Mirror Saw on YouTube asks, do you own any mass market paperbacks? Where are they? I don't think there are any on the shelves in here, but there are some in the shelves upstairs. Uh, some of my mass market paper paperbacks uh, that I own were sent to me, such as Orson Scott Card. I read Ender's Game uh, a long time ago uh, because of a recommendation from a friend. Then I found out that the author, Orson Scott Card, lived in the same town in which I was living at the time, which is Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, so I just sent him an email through his website, just telling him how much I enjoyed it. And he got my address and sent a signed uh, mass market paperback of his book Enchantment to me. So I have that. I also have some other paperbacks that were gifts from uh, friends from abroad, uh, friends in Sweden, friends in France um, that, that I've kept. Um, a lot of my mass market paperbacks that I actually read and bought for myself were like Michael Crichton, Robin Cook, Michael Palmer, Stephen King, Brian Keene, Jack Ketchum, Richard Lehman, um, a lot of stuff like that. And, uh, and I've since sold all of them. But there's some other stuff. Uh, I, think there's a, I think there are some true crime uh, books that I read a long time ago. 
uh, but they're all upstairs. Guamo on Instagram asks, will you be tackling Virginia Woolf? Uh, I would never tackle a woman, okay? I just want to put that out there. Uh, but as far as reading her, yes, I uh, love Virginia Woolf. As part of my Western Court series, I'll work up to uh, and do a review on To the Lighthouse. But probably before that, hopefully this year, I'm going to finally be reading The Waves and making a video. I've been wanting to read The Waves for a long time. I've been asked this question a lot uh, in between the last Q&A video and this one. So I don't really, I can't really pin it to a specific person, but I get asked a lot, how do I find books to read? Well, number one, uh, from friends that I trust, uh, rec recommendations from trusted sources, you know, friends, acquaintances who know my taste and whose taste I trust. Uh, if there's an author that I admire, I'll pretty much read everything they have written. So that's another source. Reviews in periodicals like the New York Review of Books, the American Scholar, the London Review of Books, and so on. Aimless bookstore browsing, which is becoming more and more rare. Um, this is also what I call serendipity, and I really, really miss this. Books that are mentioned in books that I'm reading, and especially the books about books that I like to read, a lot of Alberto Manguel stuff, a lot of Stephen Moore stuff, uh, Michael Durda, they will list a multitude of different books, um, some I've never even heard of. Or I'll be reading a book, either fiction or nonfiction, and they'll mention something that you know, was a source of inspiration or input to them, uh, and I'll n note that. Interest in a literary movement or a certain culture. For example, if uh, interest peaks in Robe Grier and the uh, Roman Nouveau, uh, then I'll kind of zero in on that and read through those authors or a given culture like uh, the Latin American boom or something like that. Books on books, again, like my Norton anthologies, my Norton anthology of world literature, my Norton anthology of postmodern literature, my Norton anthologies of American literature. In fact, if you go and look for my video, I think it's like 31 books on reading. Um, those are a lot of books that I've read that have pointed me to other books. Specific Google searches like greatest modern Japanese novels of all time is the last one I can remember doing. That's how um, in, a, in my video on Kokoro, I you know made a, a little list to acquaint myself with the modern uh, Japanese novel. Curated lists that are out there, like uh, Modern Libraries, Top 100 Novels of All Time, Le Monde has one, Time has one, The Guardian has one. And then there's this sort of metaphysical sixth sense within me that just sort of leads me to books, despite all my plans for what I may be reading next or think I'm going to read next. There's something that will just sort of lead me, and it's really hard to describe. Timbo Jones on Instagram asks, what are some of your favorite book covers? Here are some that I picked off of my shelves at random. The 20 Days of Turin. This is a great cover. I also have a video on this one. The Flame Alphabet, which I have not read yet. I haven't read any Ben Marcus yet. The Instructions from Adam Levin. A Brief History of Seven Killings, Marlon James. Here I Am by Jonathan Safran Foer. Did not like the book, but I love the book cover. I also have a video on this one. Um, this is The Echoes of a Natural World, Tales of the Strange and the Strange. This is from Michael P. Daly, First Not Press. Uh, and this cover is from an artist named Kevin Barry. From Maintenance Ends, this is Rick Harsh's Voices After Evelyn. I also have a video on this one. And then William Gass's Middle Sea. I love that. I love this. Jose Luis on Instagram asks, do you like any living Spanish writer? Yes, Cervantes. Because Cervantes, despite dying on the same day as Shakespeare, is still immortal. Okay, okay. To answer your question seriously, uh, I would say maybe Javier uh, Marias, or perhaps this uh, Catalan writer, Juan Cabré, Confessions. I've been sneaking this in on the side. This, whew, I'll be doing a video on this one. Great read. Andre of the Untranslated asks, do you believe in innate writer's talent versus hard work to ensure becoming a good writer? So basically, is there such a thing as this just natural innate ability that makes someone a great writer? Or can you simply, uh, can any person just simply put in the time, the hard work, the grit, 
and achieve that level? I would say no to the latter most question. I do believe that there is such a thing as innate talent, um, just with anything out there, you name it, from uh, instruments to chess to basketball and, of course, uh, writing. Uh, there just seems to be that some people are just born to uh, to do those things, whereas others have to work very, very, very hard and don't even come close. Now, I know that sounds a little bit discouraging, but if you're setting your sights on being, you know, someone who comes to mind as the best writer in your mind, and you set your, you should still set your sights on trying to achieve those same levels, um, but you don't want to emulate. And at some point, we have to accept that some people are just going to be naturally better, but we still have a space for our own voice and style. Christopher Robinson of Instagram asks, what began your love of reading? Can you trace it back to a single book or author? Uh, and I can't really trace it back to a single book or author, but I can trace it back uh, to a real life person, and that would be my mother. As I talked about in one of my previous Q&A videos, you know, my mother was a big reader, her mother was a big reader, her sister was a big reader, um, and I grew up seeing them reading all the time. Uh, when we would visit my grandmother, every evening she was in her recliner, and she would put lotion on her hands, uh, and then she would read whatever book she was in the middle of uh, at that time. And same with my mother, who was a school teacher, and she had the summers off, and in the summers we would go to the library every week. I do know, like I said earlier, uh, to another question, Calvin and Hobbes was very early on the, the first thing that really struck me. The thing about Calvin and Hobbes is, yes, it's a comic strip, but it's infused with lots of advanced vocabulary um, that contextually for children, you can sort of grasp the meaning without knowing the words. And that was my, my first, uh, the first time I came into contact with something that really made me want to go deeper and deeper as a reader. Kaido Loveboat asks, which books were most important to your worldview slash character development? And a couple of other people have asked that same question, so I'll just wrap it up into one. Uh, the Bible, which I've been reading uh, all of my life and continue to read. Also, uh, many different philosophers, notably Plato, Kant, Kierkegaard, Eric Fromm, Nietzsche, and uh, Richard Rorty. Also, I would have to say Shakespeare, uh, especially the major tragedies and his sonnets, Montaigne, his essays, Cervantes, Proust, definitely the mid-19th century, well, let's just say 19th century American writers uh, grouped in with the Transcendentalists, uh, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, and Herman Melville, and also the essays of Marilyn Robinson. Bulgakov's Cat on Instagram asks, or first states, Ars longa, vita brevis. Art is long, but life is short. The famous aphorism from Hippocrates. So how to choose what to read? Well, this is my advice. Yes, life is short. Uh, as someone just recently reminded me, Harold Bloom has this great statement. He says, at some point, we realize that we are reading against the clock, and that's the clock of our immortality. And of course, there are way more books than we can read in even one lifetime. So at some point in your life, you'll start to realize that you inevitably have to be more selective. So my advice uh, and what I've done when I realized that, I mean, I just read, I just read whatever for a long time and, and just enjoyed it. You know, I gravitated toward what I enjoyed. And I think that's what everybody should do. But at some point I realized, oh, okay, I can't, I just don't wanna willy nilly do this because I don't have several lifetimes to explore all this literature. So I began curating lists that I stick pretty closely to and things that were just already in the, the uh, storage area of my mind. You know, lots of classics, lots of major uh, world literature. And, but I would also say to, you know, give yourself, give yourself some, what should we call it? Mm, I can't really call it rewards or incentives because honestly, the more you study the long suffering and much heralded throughout the ages, great works, uh, they become their own rewards and their own incentive. But give yourself chances, you know, stick closely to the different canons. You don't have to read just any in any one canon. Look at the amendation 
th that was done with Clifton Fadiman's famous lifetime reading plan to expand it to the Eastern world as well as the Western world. You know, look at that whole can and, you know, read the great books, engage with them, grapple with them. If you hate one of them, but, but it's highly taught as a classic, you've got to keep working at it until you start to understand because they will go to go to work on you as well. Put it aside for a while. Uh, wait a few years, come back to it, see what happens. But I would say every now and then take a take an opportunity to read something you're curious about, no matter what it is. If it's if you consider it trash, but it entertains you and you like it, do that every once in a while. Nothing wrong with that. Dylan Reads on Instagram asks, how do you decide when a book requires secondary texts? So like commentaries and things like that, criticism, uh, sort of like I did with Mason and Dixon. And really for me, anything that I judge to be so multi-layered and complex and nuanced, uh, like Mason and Dixon, and something that I know I won't get everything out of it that is to be had in even five plus readings. Um, then I'll turn to some, some commentary and some criticism and so on. Uh, sometimes even if I don't get the person at all, at all, like I'm reading this, but there's some curiosity. Something sparks within me, like I don't, not understanding uh, this person's poetry, let's say, but I see that a lot of critical work has been done. So let me go uh, and see what they say. Because the thing about commentaries and criticism, skeleton keys and all this kind of stuff, readers, companions, is they really do help us uh, widen our borders for a given book. And I think that's always a healthy thing to do. Um, we should never fall into this thing where we think that we are the end all be all of pronouncing judgments, value judgments upon a text. <laughs> 2001 Space on YouTube says, how do I read and enjoy L'Etranger, The Stranger, Albert Camus? <laughs> well, how do you read and enjoy it? I can't tell you, you know, how to enjoy it, uh, but to reading it, you just simply read it. And I know that sounds reductive, possibly condescending and simplistic, uh, but it's written in a very, very simple manner, uh, both in the French and uh, English translations that I've read, but how to enjoy it or how to, how to go into it with a good context, just remember that Camus sees life as absurd. It's just fraught with absurdities. Uh, and Monsieur uh, Merceau, that's his name, right? Monsieur Merceau, yeah. Uh, you know, he, he just wants to, he just wants to live his life and do this and that. And, you know, why engage with all these laws and rules and consequence and ethics and morals and all that stuff. Everything's absurd anyway. Klein Coffer on Instagram says, are you familiar with Nelson DeMille or Elmore Leonard? These are crime novels. And I've already confessed that no, I'm not. Um, with, uh, with crime novels, I don't know a whole lot. Although I am soon going to be reading some of the LA Quartet by James Elroy uh, due to uh, popular demand. Guamal of Instagram asks, any interest in doing a retrospective of literary movements? You know what? That's a really good idea. And I have been thinking about doing these more like survey videos. I thought about doing like a survey or maybe series. I thought about doing a survey series extending my why read philosophy, which is really why read Western philosophy that includes uh, my own little uh, reading list. I thought about turning that into a survey series where we actually go through all of those books. But that would be cool to take one movement, uh, you know, here and there, or, or look and zero in on something and do a survey of the major writers and their works and so on. So yeah, I think that I think I should do that. Marcel Hidalgo. I wonder if that was, are you missing a D? Is it supposed to be Hidalgo? Sorry, I'm reading Don Quixote right now. And it's just Hidalgo in all the in Cervantes. It's all my mind. Anyway, of YouTube asks, have you seen the French movie Three Colors, Trois Couleurs, uh, and specifically Bleu, or Blue? Yes, I've seen all three of them by that great Polish filmmaker. Um, I saw Blue, uh, was the first one that I watched, uh, and, and yeah, I, I, love, I love those movies. I think earlier I, I mentioned something about film, and I didn't mention those movies. Um, they're wonderful. 
Pennywall on Twitter asks, has Leaf by Leaf made the PhD less important? And you're probably referring back to one of my early videos when I explained about my, my endeavor to enter a PhD program and then how that fell out. And, um, you know, there's still something within me. I want to be in school. I love school. Um, and I especially want to be in a PhD program with access to people who can kind of guide me along and I can really uh, attain some, some expertise in a certain area. But you know what? Leaf by Leaf, this channel was part uh, coming out of uh, that aftermath. <laughs> I call it aftermath because for me, it really was a blow when I received the, the letter that I didn't get accepted into that cohort. And I think that, you know, part of that and then just that driving need to, to get an outlet for this passion that I have, you know, are part of what drove me to make this channel. And to be honest, it has been a blast sharing this stuff and engaging and meeting so many different people, getting tons of awesome book recommendations uh, from a lot of you that, uh, you know, never would have opened up as part of my PhD program. I, I don't think that it has made it less important. It's still something that it, it's a goal of mine. And once I have a goal, I like to stick with it until it's done. Uh, for example, my Murakami challenge, self-imposed that is, they're, they're almost always self-imposed. Um, so I think one day I'll go back, but right now, my working plan is that I'll wait until my daughter is off to college, uh, and then we'll both be in college together. Pennywall also asks, can we organize a Volman interview somehow? Sure, that, that would be incredible. If you know a way, or if someone knows a way to make that happen, I'd be all for it. But um, I have no clue where to start with <laughs> getting in touch uh, with the great Volman. I am in touch with uh, Michael Silverblatt, who is uh, good friends with Bill, as he calls him, but I don't, I also don't want to ask any favors of Silverblatt. I don't, I don't want to add to his schedule or become one of those people who, you know, want something uh, from him. I'm just enjoying uh, the conversations. Uh, but by all means, uh, I, I would, that would be incredible. Your favorite book series as a child. Uh, I've already talked about Calvin and Hobbes, that for sure was my favorite book series, but uh, another one that springs to mind is also the great A Wrinkle in Time. That question uh, came from Instagram from Jenny Meyer. Thank you, Jenny. Full Beard Lit on Instagram asks, when are you getting back to your Western Core series? Well, my friend, I am in fact currently reading part two of the great Quixote by Cervantes. So that will pick that series back up. And then after that is the uh, great English epic, the greatest English language epic, John Milton's Paradise Lost. Malik Vallo on Instagram asks, will you make videos on Pynchon's other works? Uh, I have a video on Mason and Dixon, and yes, I will. And in fact, uh, make sure you're uh, watching this channel uh, towards the end of the year because there will be a very special video on a very special Pynchon novel. Mr. Zinar on Instagram asks, what ambient conditions do you need for reading? I actually need complete silence and solitude to be able to read. I cannot read in public spaces uh, unless I put some kind of uh, white noise or sometimes brown or pink noise, depending on the, the place uh, in my ears in, in headphones um, or on a plane with noise counseling uh, headphones. But for the most part, I spend the absolute bulk of my reading uh, in complete silence. That's how I have to have it. Daniel All Read 23 on Instagram asks, when is the next bookshelf tour? Great question. I don't currently have a plan. I don't even know which section I'm going to do next, but yeah, I, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Yogi Miner on Instagram asks, how do you cope with the fact that you would not be able to read all the books you want to read? This kind of dovetails into the other one that another questioner asked uh, when they pre and they prefaced their question with Hippocrates, his aphorism, Vita Brevis, Ars Longa. Yeah, uh, the way that I cope with it, I, I try not to ever let it get me down. I mean, if I really think about it, yeah, it's kind of a downer. You know, there I'm going to die uh, with books left behind that I that I didn't get around to. Um, but what I try to do is use it to my advantage in the present. So with what whichever book I'm currently reading, I use my mortality and my being outnumbered by great, by the number of great books, I use it to my advantage to really enjoy and appreciate whatever I'm reading in the moment. This will also lead you to be more selective 
about what you read, especially as you get older. You know, for a while, you're going to feel uh, immortal, invincible, like I did up until around age 30, um, and just read whatever. But I think the, the best way to cope with it is just to use it to, to allow yourself to take joy and pleasure in whatever you're reading in the moment. Cosmolag on Instagram asked me a series of fun questions. Beach or mountains? Mountains. Forest or desert? Forest. Bike or run? Run. So Harbor Coat 27 on Instagram asks, do you subscribe to any magazines or journals? Yes, uh, I've subscribed to a lot of them over the years, but for the last few years, I've maintained uh, active subscriptions with the American Scholar magazine, the London uh, Review of Books, the New York Review of Books, and Rain Taxi. Dylan Reads on Instagram asks, what is the most difficult book you've ever completed? I never have to think about this. It is, without a doubt, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. I don't even remember anything about it except the obvious tenets of uh, phenomenology, but I've thought about actually reading this again and creating a video that captures a one minute thought for each page or maybe each chapter or something like that to kind of go along and, and add to my Western Core series, but that's definitely the most difficult book I've ever actually completed. Vigo Gallup on Instagram asks, which text should be commonplace in world and American literature courses in high school? Uh, I'm going to be honest. I kind of side with some theories in, in pedagogical studies that I've looked at. Uh, I cannot remember the guy's name, but there's one guy who's a really radical thinker in, in the whole realm of, of pedagogy. And uh, he had the theory that we should abolish reading lists and canons in high school. And I largely agree with that because I've said it before, what high school literature and English courses tend to do more effectively than anything else is ensure that most of the students will never want to read books again for their entire life. I mean, think about how many people groan at their memories of being forced to read Moby Dick or Wuthering Heights or what have you. And that's because a lot of these books, while being great books and great pieces of literature, in high school, the average person is not ready for them. At least I know that I wasn't, and a lot of people I know were not. So when you're forced to try and get your young mind around this very rich and complex world that great literature creates, it teaches you to, to push it away, you know, and it's not something you can really relate to at the time. Instead, I think what should happen is that the students should be allowed to essentially pick their own books. Now, this means that the teacher, you know, the teacher needs to have some ground rules and some principles uh, around this. Uh, but then it also puts a little more on the teacher because now the teacher also needs to adapt to, you know, whatever the objectives of learning are for the particular class at the particular grade, figure out how to still hit those objectives, but with reading material that the student actually cares about. And so the thought is that we foster a love of learning, a love of reading, before we start fostering a love for specific books. Malik Vayo on Instagram asks, what about a video on Finnegan's Wake? It's coming. It, it, it'll be after my video on Ulysses, and that will be towards the end of my Western Core series. So probably a, a couple of years off. Plus, plus I need to get in there and actually read it all the way through. <laughs> I've never done that. And, and it kind of immerse myself in it uh, before I make a video. So eventually, eventually. Alta Iflin of Twitter asks, when you read a novel, what impresses you most? Well, the language, for sure. The style, the aesthetics of it, first and foremost, before anything about the characters, anything about the plot, anything about the setting, anything about the narrative arc, anything about the denouement, Rising action, falling action, all that to me is secondary. Primary is the language, the way the sentences are crafted, the way the words were selected uh, for the mood and for the situation. Obviously, some books aren't about that, and so I, I don't impose that on every book. But if I'm reading James Salter, for example, I'm reading it more for uh, his aesthetic than the actual story. 
um, or, you know, the obvious people, obvious stylists, Nabokov, I'm reading for the, the style, the, the, the prose style. Some books that, you know, weren't written with that being foremost, then I'll kind of put that to the background and it'll become more about the story. But for sure, to answer your question in short, what impresses me most is the craft of the writing, the language, the words. Zaginis Art on Instagram asks, are you writing a novel? Yes, I am writing a novel. I'm about halfway through. I'm a couple of years into it and about halfway through. I'm hoping that maybe by next winter, I'll have a good uh, second draft. I'm writing the first one by hand. Uh, and so the second draft will be me doing a revision and, and transposing it from longhand to the computer. So it's a ways off uh, and I'm taking my time with it. But but to answer your question, yes, um, I read an excerpt from it from one of my other Q&A videos, maybe the Q&A number three. Cowan on YouTube asks where to start with a daily reading habit. That's really easy. Uh, over the years, people have asked me that, you know, asked me, hey, how do I even where do I start? And really, as the saying goes, you don't find time, you make time. And so what you have to do is just sit down, put, the, put it on paper if you need to, but think about every day and think about how you spend your time every day. I, I like to write out daily schedules. I, I like to write out a lot of stuff <laughs> on paper, uh, lists and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But one thing is your daily schedule. So write in, you know, the hours that you spend uh, working, the hours that you spend doing X so, and start with the things that you cannot change. Like they have to be done then start to fill in the things that are huge priorities. Just each hour of your day, how are you spending that time? Uh, do you uh, watch Netflix as kind of the last 45 minutes of your day before you go to bed? Put that in there. Then sit and look at that and find, figure out how you can spend one hour. Now this is to start. How do you start with a reading habit? So I'm presupposing you don't have one. Find one hour each day, a solid uninterrupted hour and whatever you need to move out of the way, do it and prioritize writing. Dylan Reads of Instagram asks, what authors are you looking forward to reading? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to presume that you want to hear about authors whose works I have not read at all. I have not read these authors, but I'm looking forward to, to reading their stuff. So that would include, I've got a little list here, Roberto Arlt, Leonora Carrington, although by the time you're seeing this, I may have read Leonora Carrington, Colette, Luis Fernando Verissimo, Patrick White, Haldor Laxness, Vladimir Sorokin, Jose Lazama Lima, Yukio Mishima, Patrick Suskind, Russell Edson, Wendy Walker, Peter Nadas, John Hawks, Harold Brodke, and Alejandro Carpentier. I'm sure there are plenty of others, but those are the ones that came to mind. Libros y Labyrinthos on YouTube asks, who are your favorite Latin American writers? And so in no particular order, Silvino Campo, the poet Vallejo, whom uh, people turned me on to coming out of my bookshelf tour on poetry, Juan Rufo, Fuentes, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Alvaro Mutas, uh, Pablo Neruda, Roberto Balaño, Machado de Assis, Clarice Lispector, Bioy Cesares, Cesar Ayra, Cortazar, and you've all been waiting for me to say it, Borges. A Smuggler's Library on Instagram asks, who are some of your favorite female writers? Again, in no particular order, order Marilyn Robinson, Virginia Woolf, uh, Louise Gluck, Silvino Ocampo, Ricky Ducournay, Flannery O'Connor, Carson McCullers, Edith Wharton, Helen DeWitt, Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston, Linda Bostrom Knusgord, Anna Kavan, Carol Masso, Clarice Lispector, Emily Bronte, and Jane Austen. Apuntes Literarios on Instagram asks, what books have taught you the most about writing? A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. You can check out my video on that one, George Saunders. On Writing Well. The Elements of Style, Strunk and White. That's kind of where I started. Writing Down the Bones, Natalie Goldberg. 
Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, Zen in the Art of Writing by Ray Bradbury, and Stephen King's On Writing. I would say those have probably informed me uh, in terms of writing more than any other book on writing. But really, the truth is, you're really informed by every book you read. Akib Shaikh of Instagram asks, what advice would you give someone who wants to get into serious literature? I'm going to presume that by serious literature, you mean uh, of the Western world. I'm not super familiar and in touch with the literature of the Eastern world, so I will address that. Um, and I would say the place to start would be grounding yourself in uh, ancient myth, Greco-Roman myth. So this is Homer, this is Aeschylus, this is Sophocles, Aristophanes, Virgil, uh, and Ovid. And then in terms of specifically the English-speaking world, well, it actually transcends that, but a, a good acquaintance with Shakespeare, uh, especially his major tragedies and then uh, and his sonnets, but but more so the major tragedies. And finally, the KJV Bible, that is the King James Version Bible. So if you really want to get into serious literature, as as I'm interpreting what you mean, I would say that that is that's the bedrock of of everything. So basically, Homer, Virgil, Ovid, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Aristophanes, uh, the KJV Bible, and Shakespeare's major tragedies. A study of all of that is going to is going to set you up with a really solid foundation for then moving forward. Alex James on YouTube asks, "What is my favorite comedy?" This wasn't qualified for you know what what form, whether we're talking about. Uh, movies or books or, or whatever here, TV shows, I can tell you that, uh, so I'll just answer in, in the context of literature, of course, and my favorite comedy, though it is much more than comedy, is none other than Don Quixote. What books do you keep in a rereading future list to fully appreciate? This is uh, via Instagram, Ulysses Brandau 20. Three. Thank you for that question. I do keep a rereading list for the future. Uh, some books stay on that rereading list. The Iliad, The Odyssey, Paradise Lost, Faust, Don Quixote, uh, A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, KJV Bible. Uh, but some recent additions that when I finished the book, I realized there's so much going on here and it's so rich that I want to, I definitely want to come back to this. So some recent ones in, in that vein were uh, Sergio de la Pava's A Naked Singularity, also John Crowley's Little Big. Those are just some that come to mind. But there, there are often times when I finish a book and I think I need to reread this. Um, and it's not necessarily part of my core rereading. Oh, another one that just came to mind was uh, Thomas Wolfe's Look Homeward Angel. I refat of Instagram asks, Three questions. Do you read one book at a time? No, but I don't read more than one book in a given genre at the same time. So usually I'll have like a book of short stories going, a book of poetry going, uh, a novel going, uh, and uh, a nonfiction work going. But rarely do I have, uh, say, two fiction, like two novels going at the same time. Definitely not. And then also Malcolm Lowry. I, I still cannot believe this, but I have not read... Malcolm Lowry yet. How do you respond to young writers who send their work? That is an excellent question, and I'm glad you asked it, because uh, one of the completely unexpected uh, outcomes of starting this channel is that, yes, a lot of you have been sending me uh, your manuscripts for me to look over and give my opinion. But I have to be 100% honest. Uh, I have a full-time job uh, that has nothing to do with literature, um, and it's, it's pretty demanding and takes a lot out of me and a lot out of each day. And also have a family. I have a wife and a, a beautiful, precious daughter and, uh, and commitments to other things and, and stuff and, you know, family and stuff like that. So my free time is extremely constrained and I am very, very protective of it uh, to preserve it for uh, reading 
of my choice. Not that your stuff isn't important, so don't hear me say that, but reading the, the major works uh, that I'm reading against the clock, as I've spoken earlier. So knowing that, I, you know, I can't get around to anything, to everything I want to read in my lifetime, there are books um, that I definitely want to prioritize. However, I, I've been, you know, I feel guilty. Whenever someone sends me something or asks me something, it stays with me and, and it kind of weighs on me until I can address it. It, it never really goes away. Um, and so for those of you who have sent me manuscripts and I haven't responded, my sincerest apologies. But I think now I'm just coming to terms with the fact that I'm a lot busier uh, than I, or I have a lot less time uh, for, for stuff like that. However, I have been talking about this with my wife and kind of kicking ideas of, of what I could do to maybe read one manuscript a month or something like that. So stay tuned for details. I Rifat also asks, and this was via YouTube, post-its, marginalia, or journal, which and why? Uh, all of them. I use, I use post-its constantly. I'm always doing marginalia, and I keep a, like a commonplace book. Uh, I will say that, that one, one exception to the rule is my uh, seven-volume set of the unabridged Rising Up and Rising Down by William T. Volman. Because those books are so precious to me and they were so expensive, I am using post-it notes, but I'm not writing in the text. So uh, anywhere where there's a passage or a quotation, I'm writing it out in the journal and then putting my marginalia in there. Um, but that's an exception. Dalton for Dicey of YouTube asks, opinion on fiction used for escapism? Well, I think I know what you're getting at, and I get asked this a lot. Like, basically, it comes out something like, Chris, you, you are so elitist and all this. You read such highbrow literature. What do you think of people who read Tom Clancy or, or Gillian Flynn or, or whatever? I always feel so uncomfortable with these things because one thing I hate doing is I don't want to put down someone, someone else. If the way I feel, if someone wants to take a cheap airport paperback with them to the beach and read it, it's fine. I have no problems with that. Because when it comes down to it, when we talk about escapism, as in escaping reality, I think is what that means, kind of escaping the rigors of real life. I use Shakespeare, Cervantes, Proust, Joyce. I use, you know, this uh, so-called highbrow or serious literature for the same thing, for ultimately escapism. Even though I'm engaging with that text at a more critical and analytical level, still, that brings me pleasure. And from the conversations I've had with people, honestly, it seems to bring me more pleasure than even the pleasure they get from uh, lapping up Game of Thrones novels and so on, um, even though that is providing escapism. So it's really, you know, a to each his or her own type of thing. Shimanowski Lumiere of YouTube asks, James Joyce and his novels? Yes, please. I, I love James Joyce. It, I, it does occur to me that I don't talk about him that often on this channel. And that may be because it's been that may be because it's been a while since I've read Ulysses or Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man or Dubliners. But I first came into contact with Joyce years and years and years ago through his short story Araby. Oh man, it just really, really sunk in with me. Uh, and then, of course, my first read through of the Great Ulysses. I mean, that's one of those. Cornerstone, that's not cornerstone. That's one of your those milestones, those touchstones in, in, in my reading life. Uh, and I can't wait to get back to Ulysses as part of my Western Core series. Now, as someone else asked, uh, yes, I will be engaging with uh, Finnegan's Wake and, and doing a video on that eventually. But yeah, I mean, Joyce is it's undeniable uh, the contribution and the elevation that he has given to the great story and conversation of literature. Del Majima of YouTube asks, Norman Mailer or Gore Vidal? And I cheekily asked if I should throw William F. Buckley into the mix. But yeah, look, I went through a Hemingway phase. I went through a Carver phase. I went through a huge Henry Miller phase. I went through, uh, and in the same way, I went through a Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal phase. 
I never read anything of Buckley's. I'm just talking about the the uh, highly amusing debates and and uh, that went on between Vidal and Buckley. But you know these crazy egomaniacs like like Norman and Mailer and and Gore Vidal. When it comes to them as literature, you know, I think I came to Norman Mailer by way of Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, because I was kind of studying the new journalism movement in American literature. And that was out of the, um, oh, who was it? Oh, they did Big Money. Oh, it's not coming to me. It's a trilogy. It's a really creative uh, use of journalism. Oh, I know Big Money is one of them. Um, and then the 42nd Parallel is one of them. Anyway, uh, coming out of that and then Truman Capote, uh, I came to Norman Mailer and I actually read the Executioner's song first. I saw it as a Pulitzer Prize winner. It was about Gary Gilmore, the, the murderer out in, out in Utah, I think, somewhere out west. And oh my goodness, I, I, was, uh, I was completely captivated. I, I lapped that huge book up. And then I went on to read Harlot's Ghost and Oswald's Tale, The Naked and the Dead, and Barbary Shore, An American Tale, uh, Ancient Evenings, which the opening is just like poof. And uh, yeah, so I think at the end with Vidal, I haven't read as much. I've read a little bit of the sort of American Empire series. Uh, I've read the one about Washington, D.C., uh, and I've read the one about creation. And, man, these are great, great literature, but I'd, I'd probably have to say if I had to choose between one or the other, it would be Mailer. Dallas Dell of Instagram asks, Favorite jazz or classical music you know well enough to enjoy while reading? As I've answered somebody else, when it comes to the atmosphere, the ambiance that I need when I read, I actually have to have complete silence as much as possible. With music, I will inevitably... Uh, hook in uh, to to uh, the music. But I do love jazz and I do love uh, classical. The Recognitions Book Club via Instagram asks, what is the earliest novel you read that was a masterpiece? That would be The Giver. And I can't remember the name of the author. Lewis Lowry? Is that right? He also asks, where have all the cowboys gone? And I uh, I mean, I hate to say it for that, for that young lady, I believe in the 90s, who was asking that question, but I think the truth is, they were never there. Balakon Mitch of Instagram asks, who do you think is the best author currently living, American and international? Well, American, no-brainer, William T. Volman. When you consider his entire herb and what he's continuing to produce, no living writer is, is coming close to that in terms of importance and breadth and scope and style and, and on down the line. Uh, international, I'm gonna have to think more about, so I'll get back to you later in this video. Gustav Teagard of Instagram asks, who is the greatest Danish writer? And you actually, by asking that question, helped point out to me that I have actually only read Hans Christian Andersen and Kierkegaard when it comes to Danish writers. Of those two, I would have to go with Hans Christian Andersen. This is kind of obvious, but please recommend in the comments below some great uh, Danish authors. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, I was recently reading an NYRB about Tova Dilsan. I may, I, I can kind of see the name, but they were reviewing her uh, memoir or something, and it really stood out to me. And I believe she was Danish, right? Tava Dietzen, Dietzen. Um, but anyway, give me some recommendations because that's a, I think that's a huge shortcoming that I've only read Hans Christian Andersen and Kierkegaard. Seldom Thomas of Instagram asks, have you read The Sotweed Factor? Oh, yes. And thoughts on Barth's later stuff. I love Barth. I'm not a barth auditor as much as, of course, Michael Silverblatt. But Barth, I mean, from the very beginning, the from the floating opera through Lost in the Fun House, Giles Goat Boy, Letters, of course, the Sotweed Factor. I love John Barth. And in fact, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it weighs heavily on me that he has no representation in my video archive yet. Charles Myers of Instagram asks for my top three 
books. And I had to question back to him to get some parameters. And I've talked about the Bible as elsewhere. I've talked about Proust, Shakespeare, Cervantes. Uh, and thankfully, he came back and said, basically, memoirs and biographies, diaries, and so on. So with that parameter, my top three books in the vein of memoir, biography, autobiography, uh, diaries would have to be Virginia Woolf's diaries, Vitold Gombrowicz's diaries, and then I really struggle with a third one. Part of me feels like I'm almost compelled to say Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson, but I actually haven't read that yet. I can't believe it. So I think I'm going to go with Herschel Parker's two-volume biography of Herman Melville. Mr. Zenar of Instagram asks, what are your favorite short stories? And so I compiled a list and I just sat there and just waited for memories uh, of short stories that really stayed with me. I tried not to add anything too recent to see what kind of weathered the time and weathered the years and stuck with me. And what came to mind, uh, one short story that pierced me the first time I read it and has been with me over the years, over a decade since, was a story called Paul's Case by Willa Cather. I highly recommend that one. But also Shakespeare's Memory by Jorge Borges, A Hunger Artist by Kafka, The Figure in the Carpet, Henry James, William Wilson by Poe, 72 Letters by Ted Chang, The Last Disarmament But One by Joseph McElroy, which is actually pretty recent, but it's a phenomenal story. Master and Man by Tolstoy, Franny by Salinger, Joyce's Araby, uh, Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, The Yellow Wallpaper. That one has haunted me ever since I read it. And speaking of being haunted, A Haunted House by Virginia Woolf, and The Last Wolf, speaking of wolves, by Laszlo Kresna Horkai. Oh, also Goodbye Columbus, Philip Roth, What's in Alaska by Raymond Carver, and Our City by Anna Kavan. Tobias Christensen on Instagram asked me for, I'll roll up what he said. It's a very nuanced argument, but basically thoughts regarding social media and the literary life, which is actually really relevant for me because I think I've talked elsewhere. I know I talked about this on uh, when I was a guest on the Great Concavity podcast. It still seems so ironic and somewhat awkward or even contradictory that I have a literary channel on YouTube. For the longest time, I saw the internet, social media, uh, YouTube, Instagram, things like this as sort of uh, anti-literature, anti-literary completely flying in the face of the life that I was trying to live or that I seek to live, which is very much uh, given over to solitary reading and being more disconnected from lots and lots of people and more connected to the life of the mind, uh, and especially as catalyzed by deeply engaging with literature. However, here I am. I'm doing this YouTube channel. Uh, I'm on Instagram. Um, like, I like to think that I've got my toe in the waters of Twitter. Um, I'm not on Facebook. I haven't been on, on Facebook since 2017. But yeah, this is a really interesting question. And one thing that, that uh, I've talked with uh, some editors recently about is the fact that it seems to me, it appears based on some different uh, quantitative uh, data analysis in different markets and against YouTube that it's, it's so crazy, but it seems that more people are watching YouTube videos about books and about literature than reading the journals and magazines and, and online publications. That's just how it is. And the new generation, when something goes wrong, uh, something breaks on a car, something breaks on the cell phone, something breaks in the house, the very first place people turn now is YouTube. How to fix, you know, Husqvarna, blah, 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 model uh, lawnmower when the self-propulsion won't work. It goes straight to YouTube. And there's channels for everything. There's videos that cover everything. So YouTube has slowly become this sort of encyclopedia. I mean, it's completely ungoverned and not really peer-reviewed unless you count, you know, comments correcting people 
and stuff like that. But yeah, it's so crazy that this is this is how it is. But nonetheless, here we are. I will say, however, that in terms of devices and the internet and YouTube, social media vying for our time and becoming a distraction, that's something that I actively and every day battle because you know, I'm doing this channel and as far as I'm concerned, I have it right now, I have it right at the bleeding edge of what I can tolerate, right at the threshold of what I can tolerate in terms of my free time. So I sort of have a, a method down of being able to, once I'm done reading a book or whatever it is, I, I sort of, I have a really good and efficient way of churning out a video and then editing it and uploading it and doing all the, you know, metadata and stuff uh, necessary and then promoting it. Like, you know, when I post on Instagram and Twitter and Goodreads, you know, here's my latest video. I have that down to where it, it takes as little time as possible. But then, of course, I am compelled to answer comments uh, when people want to engage with me. I get lots of direct emails, direct messages through Instagram and Twitter, let alone all the public comments and everything. And I do. I want to engage with everybody because this is a great conversation. Uh, and I've learned so much through all of it. So I don't want to just be this, this soliloquist or whatever um, who shows up and dictates all this stuff and then disappears, you know, doesn't engage with anybody. At the same time, I do have to be very, very protective of my free time. Part of what comes out of that is I can't be as active as I would like to be, or as some people are, you know, I just, I, I can't um, post all the time. I try to, you know, spend time here and there throughout each day, just scrolling through and, and uh, checking out uh, what everybody's into, because I love seeing the stacks of books and the personal libraries and picked up some interesting recommendations, people I've never heard of and interesting thoughts from people. Like this implies, the literary life and the life of social media seem at loggerheads. You know, they, they, they seem to be two different camps. And so at some point, you know, we have to accept this is the way it is. You know, YouTube, Instagram, this is not the future anymore. This is very much the present. And it's only going to go farther into this direction. I think what we have to do is people who want to live that literary life, we have to make sure that we are disciplined enough to keep, uh, keep when uh, our social media engagement starts tending towards the, the realm of distraction. We have to keep that in check and make sure and what, that we're prioritizing our time uh, to actually be alone and be solitary and engage with a book, with a work of literature at a very personal level. Make sure that uh, we aren't conditioning ourselves to where as we're reading, we're constantly checking the phone or before I can even read, I've got to make sure I stage a picture and, you know, to where we're so distracted that by the time we finally settle in, we read a couple of pages, but the whole time we've just been thinking about what people might be saying about the picture we just posted and things like, things like that. So what I like to do, make sure I, as I, if I'm going to do that, I'll post a, or take the picture or post it after I'm done with my reading time. You know, so that then it's not sitting on my mind wondering what's going on in that other uh, digital realm while I'm trying to engage with the text here in, in my little solitary reality. What really is imposed upon us or this new responsibility that we have is another level of self-discipline. And so the only way uh, that I see to keep it in balance is to prioritize your literary self and your liter literary life first. Matthew Taylor Blay or Blaze of Instagram asks, who are your favorite painters? The ones that always come to mind, William Blake, Cezanne, Basquiat, Velasquez, Klimt, M.C. Escher, and Odilon Redon. To you, it's just words of Instagram asks, what is the merit of reading complicated books? What is the difference in reading commercial bestsellers versus classics? What makes a classic? 
let me answer your questions with questions because it's the best way I know how to approach this uh, question. What is the merit of reading complicated books? I would say, what is the merit of uh, eating a healthy diet and exercising vigorously? What is the difference in reading commercial bestsellers versus classics? And again, I would say, what is the difference in being a couch potato and eating junk food every day versus being careful about what you eat, uh, eating a healthy and balanced diet and working out regularly? What's the contrast there? It, it's a metaphor that I think maps really, really well, especially when you consider that someone who, let's say, has uh, only a taste for junk food and for couch surfing decides, you know what, I'm going to get into working out or reading the classics or hard books, let's say. For some people, they will find that when they get in the gym for the first time or for the first time in a while, the endorphins are released in this euphoric rush and they feel, oh, I'm doing something healthy. I'm, I'm giving my body what it yearns for and they get like a pump out of it. And next thing you know, you know, they become health nuts and gym rats. Uh, whereas other people, you know, they may get in there and they're like, oh, this, this is horrible. I feel awful. I'm sweating in places I didn't know I could sweat and my sweat is sweating and all this. And I want to go back to the comforts of my junk food. And, you know, there's just a lot you can do with those metaphors. And I think it, it answers the question. Now, as for what makes a classic other than, you know, time and tradition being handed down, uh, by uh, notable critics and things like that. This is something that's so hard to answer. Calvino wrote a book, Why Read the Classics? And he opens up with a you know typical Calvino humor uh, about how a classic is a book that we say we've read when we never have and all this kind of stuff. And he's, he's, he nails it. So I recommend that. You're also asking a question there that rolls into some other deeper questions that people have asked, and I'll come back to later in the video. Vita Nova on Twitter asks, what crafted sentences transcend space-time fulfilling nirvana? I would say almost every single one of the sentences in Mircea Cartarescu's Blinding. Check it out. I also have a video on it if you want to see that. Joe Ben Books or Joe Ben Books of Instagram says, what books have made you a better parent? Well, I would say that a lot of reading uh, makes one a better parent because of empathy and seeing how power and authority abused can be so detrimental and reading memoirs uh, of people's childhoods and things like that, everything kind of informs you uh, as far as being a parent. But, you know, the only book that was specifically about parenting that I can point to and say was really, really good was called Good Fathers, Good Daughter. Oh, no, no. Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters. I, I only have one child, a daughter. Uh, and that book really uh, was really uh, illuminating for me. Dennis Rudnicki on Instagram asks basically, hey, Cormac McCarthy, video on Sutri or Sutri? I say Sutri and Sutri interchangeably in my mind uh, when I've read that, uh, every time that surname comes up. Yeah, look, I love Cormac McCarthy. And in fact, I'm not reading uh, Sutri at the moment, but I'm reading another Cormac McCarthy book. I actually just started it today, and I will be doing a video on it. It is not Blood Meridian, sorry everybody, but I feel like, you know, that book is already so exhausted. Why, why should I come in and, and add yet an, another argument? You know, there are tons of videos, tons of writing on uh, Blood Meridian. It, it is a masterpiece. It is one of my favorite pieces of American literature. You know, I could go on and on about how much the judge haunts me and what I think he stands for, but instead I thought that I would go and pick something from his earlier fiction uh, to kick off or to inaugurate my first video on Cormac McCarthy, who is undeniably a prose master. Del Majima of YouTube asks, your favorite book to film adaptation? That would definitely have to be Shot in Tango by Bela Tarr. More on that coming up, unless I end up posting that video before this one, in which case that wouldn't make any sense. Hmm. Or I've just given you a teaser. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know what order I'm going to post these videos. Favorite film about writing. Hmm. Favorite film about writing. I, I have no idea. What films have I seen that are about writing? I have to get back to you on that one. If Von Trier could adapt any book to film, Interesting thought there. If Lars von Trier could adapt any book to film, hmm.
Clarice Lispector's The Passion According to GH. Levity Books of Instagram asks, what book most changed you as a person? It would have to be the Bible. As a reader, that would have to be uh, Edmondson's Why Read and Where Shall Wisdom Be Found by Harold Bloom and Validity in Interpretation uh, by Hirsch. What will your next book be about? If you mean the book that I'm writing, I suppose it would chiefly be about consciousness. And what books do you re recommend for people in IT? Well, if you're in software development, The Pragmatic Programmer is a classic. Uh, it's got some age on it, some dust, but it's still, uh, you know, an oldie but a goldie. Code Complete, I don't know what version it's at. The last time I read it, it was at two, so it was Code Complete 2. I think that's from Microsoft Press. Nick Bostrom's Super Intelligence, that's one of our best, most uh, well-reasoned uh, books we have right now on artificial intelligence. And The Immortal Girdle Escher Bach by Douglas R. Hofstadter. Sherd's podcast of Instagram asks about maximalist novels by women. I can't remember exactly what your question was, but there's another person that brought up some stuff around gender and ethnicity and big books, and I'll get to that later. Um, but as far as maximalist novels by women, I can say, you know, there's Vanessa Place's uh, La Medusa, which is like touted as being Ulysses, but in Los Angeles instead of Dublin or something like that. I have it, but I have not read it yet. There is Margaret Young, Marguerite or Margaret Young's uh, Miss McIntosh, My Darling. There's Gertrude Stein's Making of Americans. It's a big book, but I don't know if we can call that Max maximalist fiction. And then there's Doris Lessing, The Golden Notebook, which I have read and it's fantastic. And then there's, there's another one that I've talked about recently, Dorothy Richardson, and it's a pretty big cycle of novels. But outside of that, I don't have much experience or, or knowledge. I know maybe Ursula K. Le Guin, she has like the Hainish uh, series or something, but I haven't read that either. 2001 Space on YouTube asks my opinion about Berryman meaning the filmmaker, the Swedish auteur Ingmar Bergman, and the seventh seal. Love, 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 love Bergman, which should be apparent from my recently posted review of Greg Gerke's essays. He also is a fan of Bergman. You know, when you asked this, I actually went and rewatched Seventh Seal that night, and I think it's an absolutely brilliant allegory. It's the, the anguish of wanting to know the truth and authenticity of the idea of God and wanting to hear from God, but only ever being able to come face to face with death. It is so wonderfully captured. It's excruciating in that film. Wendy Black says, what book changed your worldview the most? So I'm going to take this to mean that I had a worldview and it was changed by this book. And so that would have to be Robert Piercig's two books on what he called the metaphysics of quality. And uh, the first book is Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And the second one is Lila, or An Inquiry into Values. You must read both books together. Uh, but those rocked me. Most people don't even read the second one. And I, but I don't think that the first one, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, is blown out of proportion. If you really engage with it, there are some serious truths in there that helped me especially to understand who I was and the world in which I'm dealing and how to, how to reconcile these things. Thomas Liam 300 of Instagram asks, who is your favorite secondary literary character? Does Sancho Panza count as secondary? At least in the first Quixote, the second part of the Quixote, he sort of becomes the central character for a long time. Mike Humowitz 811 of Instagram asks, is there a country whose liter literature you favor? Well, it's probably going to be a Latin American country uh, at this point, possibly Argentina. So much great literature coming out of there, but also France. But that be, could be also because uh, it's the only other language that I, I spent a lot of time trying to learn, and that led to reading literature, uh, a lot of literature in the original French. Um, so I would say it's kind of Kind of neck and neck between France and, and Argentina. Extra Centaur of Instagram asks, ever read a book in English and think that it would lose its beauty if translated? That's really interesting because I've never thought that before. I've never considered a book written in English that I feel like would lose its beauty if translated into another language. But the more I thought about it, the, the more I'm convinced that my answer is 
Russell Pearson's The Way of Florida. Mario of YouTube asks, if you could transfer to video the thoughts you had while reading one book, which would it be? That would be Gerda Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Thread, An, e An Eternal Golden Braid by uh, Douglas R. Hofstadter, because my thoughts were so complex <laughs> and multi-layered while I was reading that book um, that I struggled to even get them out on paper. So if I could have them transferred uh, to video and be able to watch that video and then take notes of that, that would be excellent. Marco Angel Lit TV. Hold on. Marco Angel Lit V. Angel Lit V. Marco Angel It V5. Sorry. On YouTube asks, what's your favorite short story slash collection? What book do you want to reread on your deathbed? My favorite short story collection is the collected short stories of Borges. And the book that I want to reread on my deathbed would be Moby Dick. Interior Odyssey of Instagram asks, what makes a book a masterpiece? Sean S. of YouTube asks, uh, lots of questions around what basically boils down to the correlation of big books and straight white upper class males. Akib Shaikh asks of Instagram asks, what books should everyone read? The Full Shelf of Instagram asks, what separates good writing from bad writing? I name all of these questioners uh, in one clump because I just uh, want to take some time to address all of the different topics that are represented by those different questions. So we're asking the question of what really separates bad writing from good writing? You know, what makes a classic a classic? How can someone say that book A is better than book B? What are we basing that on? Uh, and then furthermore, you know, we're, of course, we're bringing in topics of what roles gender will play and gender and sexual orientation and religion, ethnicity, the idea of a canon. How does a work uh, become canonized? Who sets the canon? What's the deal with all the big, complex, you know, maximalist novels being basically the work of wasps. I would like to start off by saying that I feel really inferior and inadequate in addressing all of these types of topics. In fact, it's, it's very uncomfortable territory for me. I'm, I'm very much more of a pacifist and I, I don't really have any chips on my shoulder or axes to grind. From the very beginning, I have just loved to read. And I never, for the longest time, I never even thought about mixing in any type of social activism with that or, or anything in those means. Furthermore, in grad school, when I was in different workshops during gender studies and ethnic studies and or sexual orientation studies, you know, what I saw happening, happening around me is that people would get very sensitive and very heated very quickly. And it always made me feel so uncomfortable because I, I have always hated seeing people disagree and not get along. Though, I mean, I'm not naive. I know these things are going to happen. You know, we human beings have different values that they hold dear and, and ideas that they hold dear. And when they come into conflict, you know, these, these things are going to happen. I will also say that the unfortunate consequence of introducing these topics and debates into literary studies is that we would very quickly veer way away from the book, you know, the writing, the aesthetic ex experience, the story. And suddenly, suddenly what was happening was we were on personal soapboxes railing against each other. And I just, there was something that I couldn't quite get my head around there. And furthermore, as more of the pacifist and the neutral territory, the Switzerland, if you will, of these workshops, you know, I would often uh, get called out for uh, being privileged, for being in a, in a position where, well, I didn't have to be passionate about these things or, or enter into these debates. And that's what was wrong with me. And I just, I felt that victimization and I, but I quickly realized that what was happening was I'm feeling via projection 
the victimization that these others were feeling. And I had to accept and I had to really change my way of thinking. I had to put down some of my walls, uh, meaning the walls that I <laughs> used to cloister myself as a solitary reader and not really not really want to you know, get out there and be a part of the messiness of humanity, which in the end is wrong. But I realized that I had to get outside of myself and really listen to what different people were saying and realize that their experiences were very different from mine. And then it became more clear why for a vast sum of people, even in literary studies, you can't separate your personal experience. In fact, it is your personal experience that you inevitably bring into the work. And so as much as I wanted liter the study of literature to be this more scientific, objective uh, study where we can comb through these different works and neatly form rubrics to which we can apply other works and then crunch the data and see where they landed. It just isn't like that to give a definitive statement on why some books are better than others, why some books should be canonized and others shouldn't, what makes good writing versus inferior writing. You know, this is very, very subjective territory. Nonetheless, I do want to start off by pulling from some other people who are much greater than I on the subject. We'll start off with Longinus on great writing or on the sublime. He tells us that the great works have great passages with a high distinction of thought and expression. Great writing does not persuade. It takes the reader out of himself. The startling and amazing is more powerful than the charming and persuasive. If it is indeed true that to be convinced is usually within our control, whereas amazement is the result of an irresistible force beyond the control of any audience. That would be the, the force coming from the writing. And greatness appears suddenly. Like a thunderbolt, it carries all before it and reveals the writer's full power in a flash. And I see I, I made a, some marginalia here, and I, I said to think about Melville's Ahab. We'll see uh, that Harold Bloom was indeed informed by Longinus. This is from his Western canon. When you read a canonical work for a first time, you encounter a stranger, an uncanny startlement rather than a fulfillment of expectation. Read freshly, all that the Divine Comedy, Paradise Lost, Faust Part II, Haji Murad, Peer Gint, Ulysses, and Canto General have in common is their uncanniness and their ability to make you feel strange at home. Bloom tries to define uh, what attributes uh, make a work canonical. He says, aesthetic strength, which is constituted primarily of an amalgam. And that amalgam is mastery of figurative language, originality, cognitive power, knowledge, and exuberance of diction. But we have to remember, Bloom's idea of the use of studying great works of literature is simply this. All that the Western canon can bring one is the proper use of one's own solitude, that solitude whose final form is one's confrontation with one's own mortality. Calvino, why read the classics? His, uh, he, he adds in you know, the Calvino-esque humor, but he says reading a great work for the first time when one is fully adult is an extraordinary pleasure, one, one which is very different from reading in one's youth. At a mature age, one appreciates or should appreciate many more details, levels, and meanings. And, you know, the more I've thought about this, the more I wonder if even I, at 36, am fully qualified yet to uh, make judgments about what is canonical and what is a great work. Do I have enough life experience? Because as I've talked elsewhere, I fully agree that when we're in high school, we're not ready for Moby Dick. We're not ready for Pride and Prejudice. A classic book is one which has never exhausted all it has to say to its readers. And you, this, this is true again and again. 
sort of like what Bloom was saying, Clifton Fadiman in his lifetime reading plan in the um, preface, he says that reading these works will help to change your interior life into something a little more interesting. These books are life companions. Once part of you, they work in and on and with you until you die. They should not be read in a hurry. And uh, one of the outcomes of reading great literature is that we will have disenthralled ourselves from the merely contemporary. And, you know, that comes up again and again. What makes a book a mere period piece versus something that will have lasting value? And typically that's answered by saying that it hits on uh, such universal uh, topics as life and love and bitterness and envy and death and God. Mortimer Adler, in his classic text, How to Read a Book, he says, a good book can teach you about the world and about yourself. You become wiser in the sense that you are more deeply aware of the great and enduring truths of human life. I think that that hits on uh, a key for me, is that the great books are the ones that most fully realize and express the major ideas that mankind uh, has had throughout the ages. If the book belongs to the highest class, the very small number of inexhaustible books, so there again, that idea of uh, a great book being one that cannot exhaust its ideas and it's what it has to say to you. You discover on returning that the book seems to have grown with you. And this is so true. Every time I've gone back and read Dante or Wolf or Austin or Proust or Montaigne, it's not the same thing that I read before in kernel, yes, but it grows along with me. Mark Edmondson in his trim but excellent little book, Why Read, gives us a sort of like bumper guard to, to keep us on track. And he says, in general, now he's being cheeky here, sarcastic. In general, critical thinking is the art of using terms one does not believe in, such as Foucault's or Marx's, to debunk worldviews that one does not wish to be challenged by. And he's cheekily telling us that that is not critical thinking. And I think that's a great bumper guard because so easily the so-called great works can be abused even by those who claim to love them and live by uh, and exemplify their ideas. Edmondson says the ultimate test of a book or of an interpretation, now that's key, is the difference it would make in the conduct of life. As much as I just want to be an esthete, just truly, just savor the books for their sentences and craft, you know, it does come down to constructing a set of ethics by which we will live by. And as we continue to read against the clock, that measure of the difference this book would make in my conduct in life will become more and more important. Some questions are put very pointedly, such as, should, in light of different social issues and progress, do, should I deliberately seek out, say, works by women or works by black people, and on and on and on? And I would say to that, yes. If you're like me, there is probably a part of you that when someone tries to push something on you and say, oh, you need to read more stuff, blah, 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 there's a resistance. And this even goes to when works by whoever, even my favorite writers, are almost like overmarketed or, or pushed. I feel that I'm, I can feel that I'm being persuaded and coerced. And I react against that. And I tend to put it off until the buzz dies down. And then I go to it on my own. So I'm not seeing it through the lens of the pressures of the culture around me. But you know, that's just part of who I am. And I think in the end, it is very important to deliberately read outside of yourself, read to see who others are instead of constantly reaffirming who you think you are. Now, in terms of gender, I do think that there's sort of a natural, usually, and in most cases, a, a natural tendency for men to gravitate toward male authors and women to gravitate toward female authors. My mother and I noticed this growing up. Every week we would go to the library. Uh, you know, I was seven years old, eight years old, so on. And I would just naturally gravitate toward male authors and my mother would naturally gravitate toward 
female authors. And for a while, we didn't even realize this. And, and one day, I think I was talking about an author that she should try. And she, she may have been talking about an author I should try. It may have been Mary Higgins Clark, whom I started reading and loved at that time in about sixth grade or so. We realized, huh, that's interesting. We do sort of gravitate toward people who, who mirror ourselves. And so, yeah, I think we should deliberately try to break this. At the same time, there's a part of me that really doesn't care because I just want a, a, a well-crafted work of art. If I could, I would like to just read books based on their merit and not even know anything about the author uh, or the story. I never, I can't say I ever seek out a book for its story, to be quite honest. As for why so many of the big books are, are, and the great books are written by wasps, part of this is, is the unfortunate history that only men got their works published. There's no telling what the canon would look like um, had that social stigma, that social moray been in effect for so long. I'm sure we would have works by all kinds of incredible women over the centuries. As for why uh, it's primarily males who write the big books, I mean, I really don't know. I'm not really qualified, I don't think, to, to make guesses and, and so on. But just based on my intuition and from what I've seen just in real life, I would say it's because women are much more articulate and eloquent uh, and don't need uh, to expend so many pages to get the main idea across, which completely flies in the face of the stigma that women are much chattier than men. I think it's the inverse uh, when it comes to fiction for whatever reason, or when it comes to writing for whatever reason. But if big whoppers of novels, you know, were primarily written by women, I'd still read them. As for the sort of socioeconomic strata and its bearing on writing, I think that's, that is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it, I don't think it's, it's any big surprise that uh, people who are more well-off have more opportunities, which is very unfortunate, but that's how it is. And that leads us into uh, a brief discussion on, you know, capitalism and America. I mean, when it comes down to it, publishing, it's about money. And as the tide is starting to change and put women and black people and Asian people, non-binary people more into the frame, you know, all the people that have been neglected over the centuries. I think we will see that marketing engines behind major publishers are going to pour out their coffers and on that, just like it would no matter who uh, is at the forefront. I can't name names, uh, but I do know that a very notable white heterosexual male who was about to uh, turn in a manuscript to, at a major publishing house was told to wait a few years because books by his demographic aren't going to sell very well. From that, certainly we could, we could lash out and rail on and on, but in that context, and in many of these contexts, what it really comes down to is money and commodification. I think in the end, all I'm trying to express is that you can't generalize, you can't make definitive statements when it comes to human beings, when it comes to the humanities, you have to be very, very careful because the moment you make a definitive statement or you generalize, there are a thousand situations that will completely contradict what you say. So in the end, we need to learn to be more open. Don't be closed off. Try to see the human being through everything that's going on and open yourself up to literature that you don't naturally gravitate to. And as far as canonization or value systems and judgments for literary works, this is, was, and always will be a work in progress. I think from some of the people that I've, I've uh, excerpted from, we've got some pillars to help guide us in this framework, matrix, rubric, but it must be open and we must be open to reevaluation and consideration. I really hope I've expressed myself well. Like I said at the start of all of this, I feel very uncomfortable when I'm in this territory. Nonetheless, 
those are some of my thoughts. Extra Centaur, otherwise known as my Italian friend on Instagram, whom I've really enjoyed chatting with. He says, do you feel privileged to be a native English speaker since many, many pieces of world literature have been translated into English? And yes, I do. I feel very grateful uh, to be a native English speaker because it is uh, largely the lingua franca of the world. As with most things uh, in history, there is sort of a, a dark cloud that looms over that because, of course, there's the uh, colonialization and imperialism of Britain first and, and now America that has driven that. But nonetheless, yeah, when it comes to literature, I am thankful because otherwise I wouldn't be able to read so many great pieces of world literature. Now, I do wish that I could read them in their original languages. I wish in many ways that I had been forced to learn many more languages the same way that people outside of America are forced to learn English. Dylan Reeds asks for my top five authors. Oh man, I, I, these are the, the, these types of questions are the ones that I always have to go back and forth and basically put so many parameters around it that it, it's, and, and get it so specified, but just, you know, blanket top five authors. Huh. I mean, I would ask living or dead, both uh, American, non-American, does poetry count versus prose, fiction, nonfiction? Uh, but just off the top of my head, um, it would have to be, I mean, top five authors. I would say Dante, Shakespeare, Cervantes, mm, Proust, and Joyce. I think I'm reasonably satisfied with that. Dylan Reeds also asks another hard question. Any modern writers that could ascend to the level of Gas, Gaddis, Barth, Pinchon, etc. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe Adam Levin, you know, those figures represent a completely different epoch in literary history. And the way things are trending, I honestly don't think so. Because I don't know, when we say that level, level or that ilk of writing, I just don't think that much of it is going to be produced. But let's be hopeful, you know, I mean, uh, let's maybe not look for the Barths and Pinchons of the world, um, but rather look for some new strain. Vigo Gallup asks, which post-1940 texts are a part of the literary canon? And what I did was I ended up exporting my Goodreads library, and I filtered the original publication date of all the books, uh, and I made it uh, anything greater than 1939. And I started to go through and highlight all the books that I would say are part of the literary canon. And I'm telling you, <laughs> by the time I was done, it was well over a hundred books. So there are just too many uh, to name. Uh, but maybe I'll take questions like this and sort of roll them into a, a different video. So I apologize that I can't answer specifically. It's just so many of them. Artsy Zone 2020 says, what's the most depressing book you've ever read? And I would have to say uh, that it's either Where the Red Fern Grows or Charlotte's Web. Ulysses Brandau 23 asks, which books by living writers do you think will become canonized? And I just honestly kind of like the other question about post 1940s books that will uh, become canonized. I'm just it's there's so many of them. But then living writers does narrow it down a little bit. But I honestly just don't feel like I'm as in touch with that many contemporary writers to be able to make a sound judgment. So I'm going to roll that question into a different video. Slug Operator of YouTube asks, what is the worst, least favorite book I've read? It would probably be something from Dan Brown or Dean Koontz from way back, but I just, they're insufferable. Peyton of Goodreads asks, what does postmodern mean to you? Well, I think the, the best statements of postmodernism come from the preface from the editors of the Norton Critical Anthology of Postmodern American Fiction and also Brian McHale's book, Postmodern Fiction. That's probably uh, sort of the, the defining uh, critical text. But to me, it means something that's completely decentered. Uh, I can't remember the theorist that came up with the analogy of the rhizome. Maybe it was Gilles and Deleuze. I can't remember. 
But anyway, the rhizome represents something where the layer, not only is it multi-layered, but it's all swirled in together and there's no real centering. And furthermore, it just seeks to do its own thing in a very fragmented way. Again, the, the decentering. So I think of works like The Mystery Dot Dot by Matthew Macintosh. That really represents a postmodern work for me. Um, to be quite honest, I don't really even group Gaddis's recognitions into postmodernism or infinite jest. I think, uh, along with some other theorists who have stated this, that that sort of represents a, a, a new wave of modernism. But, I mean, postmodernism, this would be like Raymond Fetterman, B.S. Johnson, Steve Tomalusa. I would say the more bewildering it is in both form and content, the, the more postmodern it is. Epistemology is completely put in check. There's no way to answer how we can know something from this text. And again, just decentering. So I, I would say an attack, an assault on uh, epistemology, um, sometimes even ontology, and on any kind of grounding. That's a good question. Perhaps I'll make a, a, a separate video uh, on uh, modernism versus postmodernism, because you're right to ask it. Uh, there seems to be no real satisfying answer or definitive gauge for what is modern versus postmodern. Omar Velasco Santiago of YouTube asks me for my thoughts on Derrida. I think Derrida is extremely gifted. Um, I, however, struggled through <laughs> studies of Derrida in school, and I haven't gone back since. So I can't say anything really substantive on him. Uh, but you've really sparked my interest in revisiting on grammatology, which I only read in excerpts. Um, I think that would be a great one to come through now and and make a video. Kant's Ding on sich, or the thing in itself, post-structuralism, and a meaningful reality beyond language sort of all, all mixed in there together. Yeah, I, I do believe with Kant that there are two different worlds. There's a shadow world that we can't really access except by some strange indirect means. And, uh, you know, the reason, and beyond language, I do think there's a meaningful reality uh, beyond language. And uh, one way that I can sense this is through music. Well, I'm talking about like classical music, jazz, so on, but it's completely bereft of language and it just sparks these sensations. You can obviously, a materialist can chalk that up to different chemical processes within my body and so on. But uh, yes, I do believe in a meaningful reality beyond language. Vishesh Chaudhari on YouTube asks, which piece of literature is overrated? To be just really blunt, I don't really want to say. Uh, that kind of stuff. You know, this is my channel, and so it's going to fit my personality. And my personality is I like to do anything to avoid division. I don't like divisiveness. On my channel, I want to talk. I only really want to talk about the things that I do like and that I do think uh, people should be reading, uh, even though, you know, some, some people have talked about my negative criticism of Haruki Murakami because of that challenge that I've imposed upon myself. Um, but there, even, even there, I'm seeking to provide a balance and that's sort of stretching me. There are so many places you can go to, to find uh, negative statements and, um, and, and divisiveness. I just, uh, I want to keep, I want to keep this one more uh, of a channel of appreciation and unity. Spare Words says, why is Novel Explosives the best novel of the 2010s? And I, I think it's one of the best. I'm not sure it's the best, but I do think it's one of the best. However, I need to spend some time getting in touch with what else is out there in the, the 2010s, because again, I just haven't read that much post 2000 literature to make a, a really good argument. And I will inevitably leave many things out, but I do agree it is one of the best. Instead of prolonging this video anymore, um, I will point you to my video on novel explosives that I put out uh, earlier this year. Ben Shore of Instagram asks, how much importance do you place on reading old manuscripts all the way through? And he cites some examples like Pliny, Herodotus, 
and so on. Uh, and he says, how to extract pertinent info. And I think I know what you're getting at. So we're talking about like Plutarch and his uh, lives of noble Romans and Greeks in two volumes, uh, at least from Modern Library. Uh, Herodotus, you know, the histories, the, he's the, the father of history. We're, we're probably talking about Lucidides and the Peloponnesian War. I have always struggled with history for whatever reason. It just uh, it doesn't stick. You know, other things I read and it's like adheres perfectly to my mind. Um, but history has always been a struggle and I just, I shy away from reading it. Um, however, I've been thinking about uh, using 2022 uh, to really beef up my history. And I've already got a nice 25 book reading list that I've put together and it includes these people. I want to go through sort of the core works at least of the Western world in terms of history. One thing I would say to answer your question, how to extract pertinent info. If you're like me, you're not gonna be able to sit with Herodotus, even though he's sort of the national inquirer of ancient history. You're not gonna be able to sit with it and just read it through the way you would say a, a novel. I think that the best way to extract pertinent info from ancient texts like that, ancient manuscripts, is to have a theme or a question to take with you. So for example, William T. Volman in his study on violent means, rising up and rising down, he's gone through seemingly every book ever written, and but he's taking specific questions and ideas in there with him and reading them through that lens so that that way he sets what is the pertinent information. And so it pops out more when you do it like that, instead of just sort of openly scanning and trying to read and let it all stick. Cause there's just too much. I mean, histories are, you know, it's just too much data to take in, uh, at least if you're like me. So that's what I would say to that one. Henry Galinas of Instagram asks, are postmodern tropes in art and books a response to the reader's growing self-awareness? That's a great question and I have heard theories about how we're becoming, uh, as, a spe as a human species, we're becoming sort of over-evolved. Our, our consciousness and our, our uh, self-reflexive uh, capacities are growing way out of proportion for what we can really crunch and handle uh, cognitively. And um, so I think that, yeah, it could certainly grow out of that. I don't know if it's necessarily Postmodern tropes are necessarily a response to the reader's growing uh, self-awareness, um, but I would definitely say it is a reaction to artists' growing over-evolved consciousness, let's say. But once that's happened, I do think there's a, there is some kind of mutual exchange that's going on here. Great question. What would you tell people who don't read to convince them the humanities are worth studying? That comes from Mike Humowitz. 811 of Instagram. This will be my last question of this video and my answer uh, to people who uh, don't read to convince them the humanities are worth studying. So let's break that question down because on the front side of it, it just sounds, you know, like people who don't read and want to get into reading, in which case, you know, I would say scope out a bunch of different books read through them, read the first couple of pages of a bunch of them, see what seems interesting, and then chase that down. I don't care what it is. Kind of like my same answer of what should high school students be studying or reading. Um, and it should be their choice and something that interests them uh, to get them interested in reading. But the second part of your question says to convince them that the humanities are worth studying. So studying the humanities is quite a different thing from just simply reading. And to that part of it, I, I would just pose it as a, a question. Do you only ever want to think with your mind or do you want to think with your mind plus your heart? 